Hey folks, welcome back to another vlog. This is Gravity Falls, Season 2, Episode 14, The Stancharian Candidate. And this was a really good episode. Um, this, it was funny. It was a good satire of, you know, elections and how ridiculous they have become. Um, and it continued to do one of the things that I think Gravity Falls has often shown it handles really well, which is recognizing that the kinds of mental, you know, mind control, possession, that kind of thing is a very common feature in children's entertainment. And this show recognizes that it's pure frickin' evil, uh, which too little children's entertainment does, you know. Um, Harry Potter being the example that comes immediately to mind, you know. Uh, the Weasleys sell love potions in their, the Weasley twins, sell love potions in their joke shop. That's like selling date rape drugs, but worse, you know? Um, that's, because there is no conceivable use for a love potion except rape. That's fucked up. And, but I discussed that, I think, in the episode that had love potions in it. And this is more about you know, uh, the idea of a candidate who's really a puppet for someone else. You know, um, I've never actually seen the original Manchurian candidate, but if I remember correctly, the idea was that this, like, popular charismatic candidate was really under the control of a foreign power. He'd been, like, brainwashed. Uh, that's more or less my understanding of it. Um garnered from having seen a lot of parodies of it. It's one of those things that, like, everybody does a parody of, so even if you've never seen it, you kind of know what it's about, I hope. I could be entirely wrong. But... So that aspect of it, you know, as the show always does, was well handled, you know? Um, Gideon's line, you know, you've gotten a lot more evil since the last time I saw you. That was perfect. Because, yeah, what, what they're doing is evil. Um, putting that, but it's also part of the satire of elections. The idea that the candidate is just a face. Um, I loved Ford's line about how, you know, it was something he invented for Reagan's, a prototype he built for Reagan's masters. I mean, that's perfect. Because Ronald Reagan was a monster. Like, he was, like, his actions during the McCarthy era uh, demonstrate that. But it is a hundred percent believable that he had no idea what was going on during most or all of his presidency. Um, that he was just following the instructions of his advisors. That's completely believable to me. You know, some presidents that's believable and some it's not. Um, with, like, Bill Clinton, he, uh, George Bush Sr., uh, Barack Obama, like, those are presidents who very obviously were in charge, you know? Varying politics, varying, you know, levels of monstrosity, but they were the ones calling the shots in their administrations. Reagan, maybe not so much. I don't know that we'll ever really know. But... That aside, um, that's what makes it such a great line, is this idea that, you know, the politician is controlled by something, and that's just straight up true. Look, we don't live in a democracy. That's 
proven fact. Um, there's been studies to show this. The decisions that our governments make on all levels, you know, in the United States, the federal government, the state governments, down to local governments, do not reflect the preferences of the people. They just don't. They represent. They reflect the preferences of the wealthiest people, not the people as a whole. That's just a like confirmed thing. Uh, most of the time, what happens is what the rich people want to happen. Um, which is not a democracy, it's an oligarchy. So, in a way, our elections aren't any less ridiculous than the birdseed thing, you know? It's an elaborate ritual of questionable accuracy, given how, you know, how vulnerable our voting machines are uh, to, to, you know, hacking to losing stuff, that kind of thing, how much we exclude pe find ways to exclude people from voting, um, you know, voter ID laws, um, not allowing felons to vote after they've finished their time, um, things like that are all ways of disenfranchising large portions of the population. In particular, they're racially skewed ways of disenfranchising large portions of the population. Um, you know, this, like, drug crimes are a huge aspect there, where the same crime, the same action, you know, getting caught smoking some weed, white guy gets a warning, black guy goes to jail and is never allowed to vote again. You know, that skews the results of our elections. Um, things like affluenza, you know, where rich people are able to get off on flimsy excuses, where poor people go to jail and are never allowed to vote again. Um, and of course, the simple fact that running a campaign, like the amount of money it costs is just skyrocketed and skyrocketed and skyrocketed, so Congress people are beholden to big donors. It's all a farce. You know, it's broken. And frankly, like I said, probably not that much less accurate than seeing who gets more birdseed thrown at them and kissed by a bird. You know, at least that's got some chance of reflecting what the watching people prefer, you know? Um, that said, it is a little, I mean, on the one hand, no, Stan would be a terrible mayor. On the other hand, it would be kind of fun. Um, so it's kind of sad that they mostly reset to the status quo, other than, obviously, you know, Gideon making, you know, announcing that he's ready to make a deal with, uh, Bill Siffer. Um... But, or, you know, they reset the status quo for the Pines. And on the other hand, we did have a huge shakeup just a few episodes ago with the introduction of Ford, so maybe that's for the best. And the most important thing is it gave Stan the opportunity to be somebody. Like, no, he's not a successful mayoral candidate, but he saved the kids' lives. That's a thing. You know, when he tells them, you know, make sure I have a bigger headstone than Ford, they're like, yes, absolutely. He's saving their lives. Um, you know, and that's, you know, it's, it's the standard cliche, you know, guy who's crusty outside and all squishy inside. But there's... That's a good character type. There's a reason it gets used so much, because it's really appealing to us, you know, as, as human beings. Because on some level, at least some of the time, we're all like that. You know, we all get prickly when we're feeling squishy. Um, and more importantly is we're seeing real character development for Stan. Um, he 
doesn't just want to get rich anymore. He doesn't just want to be a grifter. He wants, you know, it, it's phrased in terms of comp competition with his brother, but what it comes down to is he wants to be, he wants to accomplish something with his life. And, you know, good on him. Some people never develop the desire to accomplish anything. Many of them go to politics. Um, that's not fair. Honestly, most people who go into politics do it because they have genuine beliefs. It's just... The only way to get anywhere is to let yourself be bought and paid for. So they either give up on it or they rationalize, okay, yeah, I'll do what the rich people want this time, but only so that I can, you know, do something real next time. Um, of course, there's always those certain people who get into politics because they want power or fame, um, or more power, more fame. Um, but I, th I think it is true that, you know, the majority don't start out, you know, going, oh, I'm going to sell out and, you know, be some rich person's puppet. I mean... If you want to do that, just, you know, go to business school, work your way into upper management, and be a rich person's puppet that way. You know, make more money. Um, but maybe you'll even eventually get to become a rich person and have a puppet. Haha. <laughs> no, you won't. Um, because... Mobility in our culture is very close to zero. I know everybody, you know, you say that and immediately people pull, start pulling out these stories of famous people who, you know, started out poor and got rich, but it really is vanishingly rare. And compared to other historical civilizations, the gap between rich and poor is very, very wide. And the gap, you know, and it's very, very hard to cross between those class lines, in part because we refuse to admit that they're there and real and ugly. Um, my favorite statistic on that is that, uh, is uh, from anthropology class I took in college, still sticks with me far too many years later, uh, that The grandchild of a slave in ancient Rome was vastly more likely to become a senator than the grandchild of a slave from, you know, 19th century U.S. Um, that generationally, it's like... Even across generations, it's hard to climb that gap, let alone within a single person's lifetime. But all we can do is you know, resist as much as we can and when things finally start toppling, Give them a good push, make it happen faster, and then we'll rebuild. What else can you do? So yeah, that's me calling for political revolution in response to a random episode of a children's cartoon show. It's what I do. I'll, um, that's about it, so I'll see y'all next time. Bye!